Okay, good evening and welcome everyone. It's also nice to see uh, familiar faces and some new uh, people. We are gathering each month uh, to discuss topics related to finances and more specifically what the Bible says about finances. A Compass is a financial discipleship ministry. This means that we teach what the Bible says about money, but we not only teach it, but we expect and hope and pray that people will experience a heart transformation and will really apply all these principles uh, with joy and uh, will serve uh, Christ and will have all their resources available to serve the Lord. This is why we do small group studies, we do conferences, we do online events like this, all with the purpose to encourage each other to uh, grow in maturity, to get closer to, to, uh, to God and to, to serve him with all the resources we have. So welcome again, and we hope to have interaction. So to facilitate this, please rename yourself so that we know each other and where are we from. And uh, be active, ask questions uh, uh, for the speaker. And um, if appropriate, if you feel okay, please also uh, share your camera so that we can see you. To use the chat, uh, you can um, uh, approach it from uh, a button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, we are a discipleship ministry. And uh, one of our friends, dear friends, and uh, is uh, Sunil Rahedje from uh, the UK. He is uh, a psychiatrist and a coach and an author of an amazing book, which is called Dancing with Wisdom. I highly recommend it. I, I read it. And I've read many books, I can say, both Christian and secular, and uh, especially um, related to personal growth. And I can say that this is among the top books that, uh, that, that I've read. And he references many other, other resources. So it's almost like an academic paper, but still extremely applicable. And he refers to the Bible so often that uh, it's, it's, it truly evaluates uh, things through the lenses of uh, the Bible. So we would love to have him uh, tonight with us and uh, he will share uh, wisdom and will stretch us to seek it from, uh, from the Bible so that we can overcome worries and anxieties, especially around finances. So uh, I will stop now and I will give the word uh, to Brother Sunil, but probably before that, I would, uh, I would pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and uh, thank you for the opportunities to be together and to, to encourage one another. Please use this time and use Sunil uh, to encourage us, uh, to edify us, and um, to, to be closer to you. And let us all, uh, in this uh, late uh, time of the day, uh, be fresh and active, um, uh, participating in this meeting. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 So thank you, Pavel, for your kind words, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. Uh, I'll just share my screen, hopefully. Yes, that's right. Just, just make sure we get on there. Um, share. Okay. Yep, so you should be able to see that screen there. Um, <clears throat> so the title we've written here is Developing a Mindset to Deal with Money Worries in Turbulent Times. Uh, Pavel and I played around with some possible titles. Another was um, uh, uh, Seeking Wisdom to Deal with Financial Worries and Anxiety. And another title we had was How Not to be Controlled by Money. And when we had that first title, How Not to be Controlled by Money, I wanted to say, if you, if you know the answer, let me know as well, because this is a challenge for all of us, no matter, you know, however rich or poor, however much or how little we have. Um, money is a challenging issue uh, and we live in challenging times. You know, there's political instability. There's we're coming to winter, you know, the, the rising cost of living, inflation, interest rates, all sorts of things to that makes money worries um so so prevalent so what qualifies me to talk to you but to you well not sure i mean I'm, I'm another sinner saved by grace i'm learning to walk faithfully with jesus day by day i work as a psychiatrist and coach i'm married to sally we have uh, four young adult children uh, i'm the author of uh, this book here as uh, Pavel mentioned dancing with wisdom a sacred quest to restore meaning purpose and fun to your life and work uh, so a quick advert some amazon kindle and audible um, but having written a book about wisdom, it, it, it won't surprise you to know that I would say to learn how not to to be controlled by money, how to develop a mindset to deal with, with money worries is what you need is wisdom. So with that in mind, let's look at um, 
from Proverbs chapter 8, verse 10 to 11, uh, from, from King Solomon himself. And what he says is, choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. So let's pause and think about this. Who is actually writing this and, and who is saying? So it's written by King Solomon in the um, 10th century BC, so 3,000 years ago. Uh, he's been described as the wisest person who ever lived and the richest man of his time. It's been estimated that Solomon had an income of more than $50 million uh, per year in, t in t today's terms. He lived in a palace that took 13 years to build. He owned 40,000 40, stalls of horses. He sat on an ivory throne overlaid with gold and he drank from solid gold cups. And every day, the daily menu included 100 sheep and 30 oxen. So however you want to measure it, that is incredibly wealthy. Now hold that, this incredibly wealthy man, what is he saying to us? You know, uh, he's saying wisdom is more important and valuable than all of his wealth. Solomon would say wisdom is a great thing to have, but no amount of gold or silver or anything you desire can compare to her. And scripture tells us to hunger and thirst for wisdom. Now you can't get wisdom, you know, by buying in a shop or downloading it from the internet. But he said hunger and thirst for wisdom as if your life depended on it. In the same way that people hunger, you know, people hunger and thirst for money. If you want to see, if you want to just type in Google uh, money making schemes or how to make more money, you'll get billions of hits. Well, because people are hungry and thirsty to make money. Solomon would say hunger and thirst for wisdom. So let me just read that again. It's a problem Proverbs 8, 10 to 11. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies and nothing you desire can compare with her. And I'm sure you know that Solomon inherited a massive fortune from his father, David. He was also blessed by God at the start of his kingship. Uh, in the Bible, in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 14, we read how God appeared to Solomon in a dream. And he was probably only in his early teenage years when God, God said to him, you can have anything you want. And Solomon's response was, with, was with, with great humility. He asked for a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. So by asking for, for, for wisdom to rule, gov to, to rule diligently and, and with integrity, we read in 1 Kings chapter 3 that um, this is what God said. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honour so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands, as David your father did, I will give you a long life. What an amazing start. What a wonderful way to, to begin. I mean, imagine, you know, God saying something like that to you or me. I mean, staggering. But, and there is a big but, a, gr a good start does not guarantee a great ending. And so despite all his wealth and wisdom, Solomon made some very significant misjudgments and mistakes in his own life, leading to a tragic overall evaluation by God. You see, as an Israelite king, he would have known and been well aware of the instructions given to kings in the book of Deuteronomy. And this is what Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16 to 17 says. And Solomon would have known this. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Now, that's pretty clear. I mean, it's pretty direct, you know, that you can't get around those very clear instructions to the king. And Solomon failed in all three of those areas. First, in direct contradiction of being told not to go to Egypt to get horses for himself, he imported 12,000 of them. Okay, you can read that in 1 Kings chapter 4, 26 and 10, 29. 
And just to put it in context, horses were a sign of enormous opulence and wealth. You know, they were like, the, if you like, the limousines or the private jets of today. They were high technology because if you're on a horse, then you could obviously kill a lot of foot soldiers. So they were, they were, they were the top type technology. And he was told not to, not to do that. Second, if that wasn't enough, he amassed vast amounts of silver and gold for himself from the treasuries of kings and provinces. And we read about that in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 8. And thirdly, he allowed, and most famous of all, he allowed himself to be enticed by many beautiful women who turned his heart astray. And so for someone who, you know, the numbers are staggering. I think 700 wives, or it's 600 wives and 400 concubines, it's a huge number, huge number. So for someone who started with so much promise and potential, it's such a tragic way to end. And in 1 Kings 11 verse 6, this, God gives a verdict on Solomon's life and he said that he was one who did evil. So think of that contrast, starting so well with so much promise. And then the final verdict is one of evil. Now, thinking about the Bible and money, um, with recommending books, here's another book. This is by Howard Dayton um, called Your Money Counts. Um, and Howard did an exhaustive study of all the characters in the Bible. And apparently, this is according to Howard, I think Howard's got a financial background. So he tells us that there are 2,930 individuals mentioned in the Bible. And we know in detail the lives are approximately 100. Now, of that 100, only one third finish well. And of the two thirds whose lives do not finish well, most fail in the second half of life which is exactly what happened to Solomon. Started so well, but as his life went on, he went more and more downhill. So even with all the blessing and encouragement of God, it would seem easy to fall away and lose so much of what God has blessed us with. And so getting a mindset to deal with money in turbulent times, learning to, to not be controlled by money is an ever present danger. That's why it's something in this life we can never graduate away from, never feel we've, conquered i think was it the puritans have a phrase is new levels new devils and whatever your level of wealth or lack of wealth it's always a challenge um and there are so many stories and examples of how money and wealth have take have taken totally taken over people's lives showing how it can be it can be a great servant but it's a brutal master we can do so much good with money but if we allow money to control us it is so dangerous and i sort of give you a modern day example of that um I don't know if you recognize this guy, but this is Ferdinand Marcus of the Philippines. Uh, he became the 10th president of the Philippines in December 1965, 59 years ago. And he holds the dubious record. He's in the Guinness Book of Records, okay? Because the Guinness Book of Records awarded the Marcus family the world record, get this, just wait for this, for the largest ever theft from a government, okay? It's estimated that in his lifetime, he stole but anywhere between five to $10 billion. He also terrorized, tortured and imprisoned much of his opposition. And then in February 1986, after three days of mass protests, a new president was sworn in. And on that very day, as a new president was sworn in, Marcus and his wife uh, fled the Philippines for Hawaii by the way of Guam. Now, just get this. So he flees with, with, with Imelda, who's also very famous. And as they fled the Philippines to go to, to their new home in Hawaii, this is what they took, okay? Taken out by the Mar Marcus family in February 1986. 22 crates of cash, valued at $717 million. 300 crates of assorted fine jewelry. $4 million worth of unset precious gems put in, in baby nappies. 65 Seiko and Cartier watches. A 12 by 4 foot box crowned full of real pearls. A 3 foot gold, solid gold statue covered in diamonds and other precious stones. $200,000 in gold bullion. Nearly $1 million in Philippine pesos. And deposit slips to banks in the US, Switzerland and the Cayman Islands worth around $124 million. So, uh, so, so Marcus goes with his, um, with his wife with all this, they go to the island of Hawaii and during their time, they lived in a luxurious house in a place called Makai Heights and they became known worldwide in certain circles for costly parties while back in the Philippines, the people, the people suffered under the debt the Marcus family had incurred during their rule. Now, 
That is so tragic. It, that's it's it's almost funny if it wasn't so tragic. It's just what a complete waste. Is that okay? So yeah. so we're going to do that. So what do you think the reason for such failures for for, Sol, uh, for Solomon Marcus, and what is the greater danger for you and me? So maybe if you've got a a, 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 a notepad, just 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 write that down. Um, I, I'm, you, I'm I'm going to um. I'm going to steal my thunder because I thought so. I'll give you some of the answers now, but you see what you've written. You can discuss this later on, okay? Um, what I want to venture to you is that the great danger for you and me is that we don't believe it could happen to us, okay? So, you know, wealth and money, I like to think of, are like the ring in The Lord of the Rings. And if you've seen the movie or read the book, you know, the ring has the power to corrupt anyone. And that's all of us, you know. And in my own life, I have to confess uh, many years feeling superior to those who waste and squander their money on expensive luxuries and selfish pursuits and hobbies. And I would say to myself, how can people be so blind to do such things when there are millions of people around the world starving? I prided myself in being wise um, and, and, and a good steward, a careful steward of our finances. And then about 20 years ago, I made some financial investments that lost me a lot of money. So much money that even now I don't even try to look and think about it really. Because it was, it was a lot of money and it's embarrassing to even tell you how much it was. So I speak to you not as someone who is blameless in this area, far from it. But at the same time, knowing that the grace and mercy of Christ gives me the confidence to speak to you. And I'm going to propose to you three key principles to keep money as a great servant rather than being a brutal master that can, as it were, shipwreck your, your, your life. And the first would be guard your heart. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. You know, other translations in, 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 in English say for, for from it flows the wellspring of life. And in the Bible, the heart and the, you know, we tend to think of the heart and the head as two distinct things, um, but they're not separated like we like to think in, in Western thinking. You know, we think that the heart is the place of emotion and the head is the place of logical thinking. That's not what the Bible teaches. It says the heart is a part of you where are your deepest trusts, your commitments and what you truly love and adore. It's the place, as the proverb says, from which everything you do flows. In other words, your heart is, your, is our, it's our decision center. It's the source of our desires and longings for what we truly want. And we all have unspoken desires and longings, which we use to justify what we do. You know, psychologists like to say that um, we make decisions for emotional reasons, but then we try to justify those decisions using logic. Or a few hundred years ago, Thomas Cranmer said, what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. So what we most love, we try to find a reason for it, and then our emotions find it desirable, and then we, and then we find ourselves doing it, even though when we, when we know it's wrong. And so in Solomon's life, he knew what he should be doing, and yet he allowed his heart to be tempted in, in, the, in, in the wrong direction. Still on Proverbs chapter four, this is the, the following verses, verses 24 to 26, uh, are incredibly insightful. What they say is, keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the path of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. And what is being hinted at here is that while ultimately the heart is a, is a central decision and control center, but our words, eyes and feet can also influence the heart. Because if we gaze with longing for enough time at an object, it can capture our hearts through our imagination. And that's why our hearts are so bad, because it's our imaginations that get captured. Um, if, you, if you know your Bibles well, you know in Joshua chapter 7, there was Achan. He looked, desired, and finally stole forbidden treasure. And that led to terrible judgment on the Israelites. And again, this is so much more than what you say you love. Rather, it's what you find yourself focusing your attention on or what you allow yourself to focus your attention on. We say that we love Jesus, but what do we allow? Is he really centered to our hearts? Um, 
there's a lovely little joke that, that illustrates this quite well. There's a story of a man proposing to his girlfriend. And he says to his girlfriend, he says, I love you with all my heart and I want to marry you. I'm not as rich as my cousin John, but everything I have, I want to share with you. And his girlfriend replies, I too love you with all my heart, but please tell me more about your cousin John. <laughs> so what is, she, what is she doing? She's not guarding her heart. And, and for me, when I think about the financial mistakes I made, it was here living in London, it was seeing property prices in London going through the roof and uh, in, in London and the UK increasing dramatically and wanting to have some of that for myself in a way that was not really guarding my heart. I told myself that I could manage the challenges agreed in my own way rather than trusting God to provide and lead his, in his way. And so to guard our hearts is to be careful about what we allow ourselves to give our attention to. We need to be very careful. We restrict what goes in and what comes out. And never has that been more important because we live, as you don't need me to tell you, that we live in an incredibly materialistic world where we're continually being promised. You know, the advertising, people are spending billions and billions of dollars to get our attention. Uh, that if you buy this product or you get this level of income, then you'll finally arrive and be happy and content. The problem is that there is no end to what our hearts desire. You know, I, 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 know exact, I know exactly how much money every single person watching this needs. It's the same as for me. All of us say to ourselves, if I just had a little bit more money, then I would be content. But remember, you know, remember the story of Marcus, you know, <laughs> Ferdinand Marcus. He certainly, had, he certainly was on that thing of a little bit, you know, the amount of stuff that he took out of, um, out of the Philippines just to be secure illustrates just that there is no end to, to, to the greed of our hearts. You know, Jesus warns us in Luke chapter 12, before giving the parable of the rich fool, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Your real life is not in the things you own or the money you have. And I like to say that money is like breathing, you know, breathing, you know, you can't live if you, if you don't breathe, but the purpose of life is not to breathe. There's much more to life than breathing. It was the same is that money is important. It has its place. It needs to be respected. But your life is much more than what you have. So guard your heart. All right. Now uh, you can share uh, some conclusions from your small group discussion. So please unmute yourselves and uh, share some thoughts. I can shortly say, say that um, uh, one uh, a natural one friend of ours were, were, was was uh, uh, sharing that uh, uh, what happened in in, in Spain uh, that there was a guy who, who was responsible for anti laundering money something like that the organization <laughs> and and in in his house found like twenty million uh, euros. <laughs> So, yeah, so the same example what you were saying so, <laughs> so, yeah, that's all about the greed you know as yeah. far as we get far away from god so we we we, we lean to the opposite side you know if, if we don't lean on on god so we lean to this all this uh, material stuff and things around yeah, so. that's right that's why guarding our heart is so important yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Radovan. Yeah. Anyone wants to share? Anyone else? From our room. Hi, Katrina. Yep. Hi. From our room, we came to conclusion that um, when we are surrounded by wealth, uh, a lot of wealth, we are surrounded by people. Uh, who are not uh, truly to us and we are lacking criticism so maybe this this would make also solomon to to fail yeah because when when we are when we are poor when we are simple we have very few friends but they are mm -hmm. truly to us and they don't they don't fear to tell us uh, you are doing something wrong but this is the mist this is the danger 
to to be in high position and surrounded by uh, enough money. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so th this would we would we discover in our our room. Yes, that's right. Yes, the way I've heard it put is that if if somebody is economically better than you, then it's, mm -hmm. if I'm economically better than somebody else, then it's very easy for me to think that I'm actually better because I have more things and then I'm better as well. That's that's the thing. Or, or if I have the skill to make a lot of money, then I then feel that I, that I I am knowledgeable about everything. But I just have the skill to make a lot of money, not necessarily about. Uh, relationships or um, integrity or things like that. So that's that's the danger. Thank you, Katrina. Yeah. Okay. Sh shall I carry on? Um, yes, please. Oh, yeah. Please go. On. So I will just uh, share screen again. There we are. Share screen. So you should see the screen should be coming. Yep, it should be there. So. Just to so just to emphasize again the importance of guarding our hearts and and, and I'll give you some suggestions on that from here. Uh, what is the importance of of growing in in gratitude? Um, and we have an abundant God who gives generously to all, and yet it's so easy to forget or ignore God's goodness to us because it's so easy to look at what we what is wrong or what is lacking. And let me try and illustrate that. You see these things, you, you see, um, what is it, three, six equations there. What do you notice about that? One is wrong. Which one is wrong? Six times three, I think. <laughs> Eight times three. Eight times three, okay, yeah, okay. Anybody still wanna say anything else? Yeah. Five, five, all right. Yeah, so this is the point, is is that our immediate reaction is to say um, one of them is wrong rather than to say that five are correct, okay? We are deeply conditioned to go to what is wrong, okay? that it, It's very deeply rooted within us just to see what what is wrong rather than what is right. So I, I got one wrong, but I did get five right, okay? Like that. And... This is deeply rooted in us. So um, if we go back to Genesis, okay, it says, um, uh, after the creation of the heavens and the earth, which in Proverbs chapter 8 we're told is by the person of wisdom, we're told, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. That's Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And the, in the garden, the man is told he can eat almost anything in the garden. Because the garden is called Eden. In fact, Eden means delight. And then we, we read, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And this is then followed uh, by, by the statement from God that it's not good for the man to be alone and that he'll make a suitable helper for him. And so following the creation of the animal and the birds, we read of the creation of the woman. Now, God has been so good to the man and the woman. He's put them in a garden of delight. Remember, Eden means delight. And with the, he's given them the freedom to enjoy it with only one restriction. And that restriction is there for their good. And it's at this point when we read about the arrival of the serpent. And it says, now the snake was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord, the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Now, if you look at that, the word used to describe the serpent is crafty. And crafty is a word that's related to wisdom, but quite different in that it's about indirect and deceitful ways to achieve your aims. So the serpent asked the question to a woman who, as far as we can tell, didn't receive the command directly from God, but she must have presumably heard it from the man. And the serpent uses the question in a very shrewd way to begin to put doubt about the good intentions of God. And it also serves the purpose of taking attention away from all God has provided onto the one thing he has prohibited. So rather than focus on the grateful abundance of, and provision of God, the focus is on the one thing that has been restricted. So, you know, it's a bit like this. So imagine um, Pavel comes to my house. 
here in England. And I say to Pavel, Pavel, you can have the whole house to yourself, okay? But Pavel, you cannot have my phone, okay? You can't have my mobile phone. You can't have that. And Pavel there s sits there and he thinks, Sunil's not very kind. He's not very generous. He's not letting me have, have, have he's not letting me have his phone. What he's forgetting is that I've given him the whole house is his. And that is in a way, it's a very small reflection about what money has the power to do. No matter how much we get, there's always more that we can have. There's always someone who has more than we have. And we don't naturally compare ourselves to those who have less than us. We look at those who have more and allow envy and greed to take, to take, to take hold of us. And it goes all the way back to the garden in the garden, to, 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 to the first man or woman in the garden of delight. Rather than looking at what we've been abundantly blessed with, we are, allow our hearts to focus on what we don't have. Here's how Dietrich, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said is He said, it's only with gratitude that life becomes rich. Or in Ephesians chapter one, verse three, we're reminded, praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, not with one or two spiritual blessings in Christ, not with five or 10, but with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And so if you like it, in other words, in Christ, I'm a spiritual multi-billionaire, multi-trillionaire. Everything that really matters for an eternal relationship with God that cannot be bought with all the money in the world is mine for billions of years, okay? It's mine forever. So how can I remind myself to keep looking with gratitude? How can I grow in gratitude? It's learning how to give generously through love and good deeds. Generosity is the antidote to greed. It's, it's the vaccine against greed is, 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 is generosity. But again, it doesn't come naturally. Even among professing Christians, giving is often not at the level of, of, of generosity that Jesus calls us to. Do you remember the um, rich young ruler? It's, he's, he's, he, he's mentioned in, Mark, in Matthew, Mark and Luke's gospel accounts. And the rich young ruler, when Jesus gave him the impossible calling to give, to give away everything he had and come follow him if he wanted eternal life, he didn't understand what, what, um, what Jesus was demanding. Because Matthew, Mark and Luke tell us he went away sad because he had great wealth. So what was his problem? Was it that he was being called to give away everything he had? Now, none of us can do that which is why Jesus later on says that what is impossible with man is possible with God. The rich young ruler thought he could come to God by, do, by doing enough good, because he, he says, what must I do to etern inherit eternal life? And he calls Jesus a good teacher, and Jesus says, what do you mean by good? No one is good except God alone. So Jesus wanted to show him that he could never be good enough. The rich young ruler was looking at his material wealth and not seeing the greater wealth that Christ was offering him. Now, I can't prove it, but I, my hunch is that if this rich young ruler had said to Jesus, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you to save me from myself and my addiction to money and material riches and save me from my addiction to goodness. Then I think, you know, Jesus would have, would have said, you're much, much closer to the kingdom now because he was calling him to repent. Because he went away, and he, but he went away sad because he was only looking at his material wealth, which he had lots of, but he didn't see the much greater wealth of a relationship with Jesus. And generosity is about being rich towards God. As Randy Alcon says, you cannot take money with you, but you can send it ahead. And so the way I spend my money in this life can be an investment for my eternity portfolio. So, you know, people are talking to us about investments, investing in mutual funds, stocks, shares, um, you know, different projects. And they're saying in five years time, 10 years time, look at this growth, look at, look at, look at where the growth is gonna be. But what God is offering us in Christ is, is an eternity portfolio that will grow and grow, not in five or 10 years, but in for billions and billions of years and even beyond that into the future. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 21, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy 
and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the question we're continually being asked in life is, where is my treasure? Is it in my money and material wealth, or is it in Jesus and my relationship with him? Is he my treasure? And that leads us to this most important question. <clears throat> where do I find the power? Because I can't do this myself. Where do I find the power to guard my heart, grow in gratitude and give with generosity? And I'd like to say to you, it all starts from how I see God. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. If I see God as my personal assistant who is there just to make me happy and give, and give me what I want, then that will produce one set of actions. It won't free me from the control of money over my life. And if I see God as an angry dictator, then I will live afraid and frightened, too scared to make any risks in case I get things wrong. No, the power comes from seeing the riches of the gospel and worshipping the one who has given himself completely to us. When we worship, then our, then our lips, our imagination, even the body are all orientated towards God. And money loses its control over us as we see Jesus as the pearl of great price. We guard our hearts by seeing Jesus as this, this, this great pearl and we begin worshipping him. We grow in gratitude as we see how generously God has given to us everything we need for life and godliness, as it says in 1 Peter, through, in 2 Peter, through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. And we see how indebted we are to the one who has given everything for us so we can give generously with joy, or as it says in some translations, to give hilariously because we see with delight how loved we are. So giving is a joy and delight, not a chore or a burden. But again, you know, that's a daily challenge because, because I'm always being tested. Do I really believe it? I have to keep speaking to my heart and getting the help of, of my Christian community to see that for myself. And these are four questions that I came across from, uh, we go to a church in London called All Souls and one of the ministers there was where uh, he's left now was Rico Tice. And he, he had these four questions, I think are, are very helpful to remind us of our wealth in Christ. The first question is, when did, call me to, when did God call me to himself? And from scripture, from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, I learned that it was before the creation of the world. It says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And that's a wonderful sense of security that gives me. My acceptance by God has nothing to do with my merit, how much money or how little I have or, or what, but, and, and what I've done or haven't done but everything to do with God's goodness and divine favour. That's when God called me, before the creation of the world. What does God think of me right now? This is the amazing truth of the gospel. God is delighted in me, in me right now because he looks at me the same way that he looks at Jesus. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, as we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It's not about what I do or don't do, but what God has already done for me in Christ through his crucifixion on the cross. The greatest work is already done. And so God looks at me as he looks at Jesus. I become his beloved son. So I can take on lesser challenges with confidence and joy because God is delighted in me because of Jesus. And then what kind of day is it going to be today? Well, you can say that to yourself tomorrow morning because obviously the day is coming to an end. I can say it's going to be an absolutely wonderful day because there are going to be lots of opportunities to become like Jesus. God tells me in James that he will use the temporary problems of my life. We're told in James, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith will develop perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking ever, anything. I'm being prepared for eternity through my problems and difficulties. And what kind of day is it going to be tomorrow? It's going to be an absolutely wonderful day, because I will be one day closer to meeting face to face with my Saviour Jesus, who is the source, embodiment and fulfilment of all wisdom and joy. So from these questions can come a great sense of confidence as I acknowledge with gratitude the miracle God has wrought to bring me into relationship with him. That means I don't live for approval, but I live from approval. And so that there's a privilege and experience of being saved by grace releases the power to change. It comes not from my own strength, but from his eternal word. And that's the word grace that sums it up. Grace is God's undeserved mercy and favour 
on those who don't deserve it. You should be punished and condemned. You know, when I told you about um, the, fact that the, 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 the wrong financial decisions I made many years ago, I can see they came from a heart that was did not, not delighting in God first. I said I trusted Jesus, but if I'm honest, my true delight and happiness was in looking for financial success. And again, there's nothing wrong with financial success. The deeper question is whether my heart is delighting more in the money he has blessed me with or more in the treasure of what he's already done for me in the gospel. Do I see that it's greater than anything money or material wealth can promise me? That's a question that God keeps asking us, whatever our financial situation, no matter how much or how little we have, is Jesus more precious to me than my money? Because remember I said earlier on, money's like breathing. You know, we need to breathe to live. If I don't breathe, I'm going to die. But the purpose of my life is not breathing. Jesus is the purpose of my life. Then we can say with the writer of Proverbs, in Proverbs 16, 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver, because Jesus has become my wisdom. So let me try and illustrate that to you. I like to call it God's mathematics. Okay, it's a simple maths exercise. Okay, you, you, you did the other one, but this is this has got. If we think about God and Jesus, are infinitely valuable. So if you think about infinity, anything you add to infinity is still infinity. So this is God's mathematics. God plus everything equals God plus zero, which means, and this is the amazing truth. That the person who has a God and everything has in the end no more than the person who has God and nothing. So God and a big bank balance and God and a zero bank balance are the same thing ultimately because I'm going to lose it all. God and a happy family and God and no family is still the same thing ultimately. So it's about him becoming more and more of our treasure. Or as the author Randy Alcorn likes to say, all of your life you've been on a treasure hunt for a perfect person and a perfect place. Jesus is that person and heaven is that place. So in summary, we learn not to be controlled by money. We learn to, to handle, to get the wisdom to deal with, uh, with, with, uh, with financial worries in, t in difficult times. When we grow in understanding what true wealth is. And I'm going to close with um, the message translation of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 to 6 12. It says, a devout life brings what does bring wealth, but it's the rich, and I love this phrase, it's the rich simplicity of being yourself before God. Since we enter the world penniless and we'll, and we'll leave it penniless, if we have bread on the table and shoes on our feet, that's enough. But it's only money these leaders are after, then they'll self-destruct in no time. Lust for money brings trouble, and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely, and live to regret it bitterly ever after. But you, Timothy, man of God, run for your life from all this. Pursue a righteous life, and this is, this, this is the real wealth, a life of wonder, faith, love, steadiness, and courtesy. Run hard and fast in the faith, Seize the eternal life, the life you are called to. So, uh, to the life you so fervently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. That's the true wealth that, that, that the gospel gives us and points us to. Uh, so, thank you for listening. Um, if you want to find out more um, about wisdom and uh, my book, it's available on Amazon, Audible, Kindle. Uh, you can get a workbook. That QR code will take you to um, a page where you can download um, a workbook that goes with the book. Um, there's also um, a podcast on YouTube on, on that theme, um, Dancing with Wisdom. Um, that's it. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you for listening. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was very helpful. And now we will open for uh, questions. You can unmute yourself and directly ask the question, or uh, you, if you prefer, you can uh, put it in the chat and I will read it for you. And uh, while you are setting up for questions, uh, I want to ask you, uh, Sunil, so we often associate greed with rich people and financial worries with poor people. Yeah. But is that true? Do, Absolutely. No. 
no absolutely not yeah it's it's, it's again it's a heart issue you know um it's completely a heart issue it's it's what is it that you are treasuring and people can be poor and very materialistic and they can be rich and very generous and not be attached to money so yeah i mean and again in scripture you know we we do you know abraham david were, were wealthy you know solomon they were wealthy people it's but it's what you do with it is the key thing yeah okay thank you thank you so i will, I will leave space for the rest to ask questions so please unmute yourself and Um, Sunil, at the at the beginning, you you mentioned um, sort of Solomon, and um, so it was more towards the end of his life um, where like things went rocky and pear shaped. Um, I suppose my question is, what is it about later life that? Oh, that's a great question. That people, I suppose, go off track. A little bit, and yeah, just, it's very can, sobering. Yeah, that's right. It's a very what, sobering as we all get older. Yeah, what can we put in That's a great question. to help prevent it? Well, I think the first step is is the awareness of it is the first is the first step, I would say. Um, and I think the danger is that we somehow feel that I've seen it, I've done it, I know what I should do, and therefore I don't need to do that's what, yeah, it's the sin of presumption. It's the sin of um, feeling that somehow or other the rules don't apply to me because, and it's resting on one's laurels. When, it, if anything, you know, I, I read a book by, it's on my shelf somewhere. If I can find, I don't think I'll, I'll be able to see it immediately, but there's a book by somebody called uh, Gordon MacDonald called The Resilient Life. And I read it when I turned 40 and he talks about the marathon runner and he says the marathon runner should aim to finish the marathon with a sprint. And then he says, if you if you look in the Bible, a lot of people, not all of them, but a lot of people who God uses are in this, you know, Moses would be an example. Abraham would be another example. God uses in later in life. you know. And so he says what we should do is we should be pacing our life. And this, this is, I think, where, where will the answer to your question is we should obviously God can take us at any time and that's up to him. But we should be pacing our lives that our most productive years for God are in our 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe even 90s. And then we go out like the marathon with a sprint so that the best is always before us. And so I think the, the secret is not living in the past. It's running the race with perseverance with the goal in front. And so it's saying, I haven't arrived yet. I think that's probably the biggest thing. Um, yeah, that, that's what would come to mind. Yeah. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, actually after reading your book, uh, Sunyo, I started reading uh, uh, this book that you just shared by Gordon MacDonald. Oh, <laughs> that's yes. That's why I showed Resi my phone. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, The Resident Life. Yeah. Actually, I recommend yeah, another book that's life. very good as well. Yeah. What's it <laughs> This is, this, is, this is by a friend of mine from my church called Dying Well. Okay, it's, it's, it's a bad, the, the, it's not a bad title. It's a, it's a slightly misleading title. It's, it should actually be called Living Well. And what he talks about is the temptations of growing old, basically, the temptations of growing old. And, he, uh, he, uh, and you know, and I think this, in a sense, with, with Claire's issues is, uh, yeah, he takes something from the Middle Ages called the Ars Moriandi. And um, so just uh, the temptations of doubt and the virtue of faith, the temptation of despair and the virtue of hope, the temptation of impatience and the virtue of love, the temptation of pride and the virtue of humility, and the temptation of greed okay, and the virtue of letting go, uh, the temptation of denial of death and the virtue of acceptance, and the temptation of self-reliance and the virtue of dependence. So it's, I recommend it. It's, it's a great book. It's on Amazon. John John White, Dying Well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. 
Oh, sorry, that book should be it. called. It should be called Living Well. Actually, it's called Dying Well, but it's really about. It's really about living well. <laughs> okay, living well. Yeah, like that. So in the second half of life. Yeah. Yes, I I want to ask. Uh, I am. Um, I heard somewhere uh, somebody explain to me that why people are surrounding themselves by wealth and they are, we are desire, desiring more and more because yeah. they we don't believe in dying. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, we don't we don't believe. Yeah, and I think the other big lie that we have in our secular world is that when I die, I will just disappear. I will just stop existing, and yet actually. It's only Western secular thinking that that has that belief. Um, you know, I think uh, was it um, um, Mark Karl Marx said the religion is the opiate of the masses. But um, the po I don't think we were anybody in in Poland here. Um, but uh, I forgot his name. But the, there was a Polish uh, president, um, Mitzlos Schloss, Schloss, I think his name. I can't. Sorry, I'm not pronouncing it correctly. So if you're from Poland, I'm sorry. But he said the real opiate of the masses is the belief in nothingness after death. And that is the mindset. Because, and so we have to get everything in the here and now. That, that's the tragedy, really, that people are deceived by. But thank you, Katrina. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Or if you have a second question, don't, don't worry to ask it. <laughs> Well, uh, I can just say, Sunil, thank you for that book. That is, I'm really going to order that because I'm 69 years old. And um, um, the temptations of growing old is really uh, um, relevant in my own life at the moment. And that, to me, was an answer to prayer. Oh, thank you. I'm going to buy it and, and, and read it. Praise God. That's the Dying Well book. Is that you said? Yeah. 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 It's, it's a great book. Yeah. So, Neil, how would you define wisdom? After reading a whole book about it, could you say there, to... there are lots that there, there are lots of ways that um, you can divide. The one that I like is um, living in God's world in God's way. There you are. That's a very simple, short definition like that. Yeah, living in God's world, in God's world, in God's way. Yeah. There are so many different angles we can come at it, but that's yeah, that, that's the one that comes to mind. Yeah, this precise one. Yeah. And and it's the skills and ability to engage with reality, rather you know, the world as it actually is, not as I imagine or wish it would be. So it's living in God's world. The reality, because it would have to face rather than my imagination in in a way that that would honor and please him. Can you elaborate on that scripture? Um, um, the f uh, wisdom starts with the fear of. Oh the Lord. yeah, the fear. Yeah, that's right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and so fear doesn't mean being terrified, but it's an appropriate level of respect and reverence. So. The, one of the good definitions of fear is, and it, it ties up, is, is the deep trembling joy and wonder that increases as I relate to God as he actually is, not as I imagine him to be. So it's a healthy reverence and respect in engaging with God and life and the problems and challenges that come, not running away from them, but with a degree of reverence that God is at work in the good, the bad, and the ugly of my life, that he's still at work, that he hasn't gone out for lunch, um, and that he's using all this for his glory. So that's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's 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 having the right attitude to God and to life. Um, that you know, I, I, I said earlier in my talk, you know, it's he's not my personal assistant, and he's not he's not some kind of brutal dictator, but that he's someone who's loved me who's come to earth in human form, died on the cross for me. And no one has loved me like this. And that demands my my complete worship and everything that I have. And the rest of life is learning to put that into practice because I know how deep my sin is. I know how deep, 
how often I get it wrong. But I need to keep coming back to him in, you know, as it says in Philippines, working out my salvation with fear and trembling. Thank you. I hope that's helpful, Richard. Yeah. Thank you for asking. So, new. there are so many uh, self-help books out there mm. coming from the pop psychology. Uh, what would you advise a Christian uh, when we are surrounded by so much, so much yeah, literature so, on this topic? So I think in common grace, God has put a lot, has put a lot of wisdom out there. There's a lot. Um, but ultimately, we have to measure everything we read and test it by God's word and by the gospel. And... You know, you know, there's the and, and you know that there, there's, for example, there's financial wisdom in terms of ways to make. You know, there are people who have great skill in making money. There's people who are very skillful with um, with their hands in producing beautiful works of art. Um, and these are all given by God. You know, it, you know, when, when we read back, is it in? Um, I can't remember. Is it? it might be in. I can't remember whether it's in, in, in Leviticus or it's in Deuteronomy, but uh, Bezalel and Olib, I'm not proud. He gave them wisdom. God gave them wisdom to uh, to be artisans, to create um, great, you know, to, to, to in, 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 in building the temple. What was your question? Just remind what your question was again. Sorry. Yeah, I think you, you, you answered the water. Yeah. There is so many books on uh, self-help yeah, yeah. books. So what but would you advise a Christian? Yeah. But is it bringing me closer to God? I've got to keep coming back to, to Scripture. Yeah. So by all means, read as much as you can and learn from other. But but you've got to keep coming back to the heart of God because I mean Solomon is such a uh, is such a sobering example, the wisest man who ever lived, and yet the verdict on his life was that he, he what he did was evil because he he deliberately disobeyed what God said. He he rested on his laurels, you know, the wealth. He was seduced by his wealth, and he, it, 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 it was used against him. Yeah. And what would you say to anyone right now struggling with anxiety? Oh, wow. I think whew, that's... I was, uh, One of the first steps, I think, would, would be to... Don't, don't worry alone. If there's something that's really worrying you, find a safe person to speak with about that and to pray with about that. Um, and don't bottle up those worries by yourself. Um, and as you, and you do that, you pray with someone for wisdom as to what things you can do. Because I think that Satan can particularly with money worries, carrying them on our own, Satan can really do terrible things in our lives if we try to carry money worries by ourselves. As or any other worries for that matter. Yeah. We have time for one more question. So one last question. This is your chance. Claire, do you... Claire, Claire has written, David was a better king in that he asked to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. But ultimately, Jesus, yeah, ultimately Jesus is the best king. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Claire, for that. Yeah. I have a couple of announcements for you. Uh, I will put them in the chat and say a few words about them. So first, uh, the next Zoom Cafe uh, will be uh, in December, on the 17th of December, and we will have uh, our CEO, Berden Hertop, lead it. And uh, by the way, uh, he, will he will talk about um, an initiative that we are launching. It's called Stop Fundraising in Churches. <laughs> Very provocative. If you want to learn more about it, come. Uh, register and we will we, uh, we will share our thoughts on what do we mean by stop fundraising in churches. Uh, we hope to stretch you a little bit with it. So if you want uh, to learn more, scan uh, this QR code or click on the link from uh, the chat. And by the way, uh, Bert became a grandfather again today. Mm -hmm. 
Congratulations. So, Congratulations. Yeah, you know, everything is well. So uh, in a few minutes when we close and pray, we can pray for him and uh, uh, the baby as well. And the another announcement is uh, that we have conference in about uh, in less than three months uh, from now. And um, yeah, it will be on hope, financial hope, how to uh, find hope about finances and we have uh, several uh, speakers on this call who will be at the conference as well who give talks at the conference starting with Sunil we deliberately invited Sunil to share um, at this Zoom cafe and at the conference who will explore more on uh, how to manage our emotions around money uh, so uh, it will be a very very helpful topic I can assure you we have Claire Nicholson here, and uh, she will be talking about uh, uh, raising personal support for ministry. Uh, we have uh, Vladi Jele from Bulgaria and Radovan Ivanko from Slovakia, who will share about um, financial advising and uh, cryptocurrency. We have Jolt, who will Jolt Shuai from uh, Hungary, who will talk about generosity in the church. Um, and of course, Bert will be speaking, Peter Briscoe, and many, many uh, others, voter droppers from Euro partners. So when you think about our conference, I want you to imagine three groups of people. One are people like us, Christians who wanna learn more about personal finances and how to align our money behaviors with what the Bible says. Second are business people, people who wanna do business God's way. And third are ministry leaders, leaders who, fail, who face issues, especially financial challenges, about fundraising, about reporting, and many other policies. Uh, so we will address all these three audiences with different workshops and sessions at the conference. Personal money, business money, and ministry money, all of this. And, um, but, as, uh, as uh, the common thing is that we will have fellowship. We really want to have fellowship. The program is not that heavy like uh, to some other conferences. So we have a lot of time, personal time for sharing, for informal mentoring and networking. So I encourage you to register if you, if you haven't. Here is the QR code and the link is on the, on the chat. February 6 to 9 in the beautiful Budapest. And uh, the local ministry is helping us a lot. And... Uh, we'll have also some sightseeing and some other uh, helpful things. So if there isn't anything else, hoping, urging, we will uh, close in prayer. And Sunil, uh, could you pray for us and for Bert? Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, we're going to thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for all that we've been able to uh, discuss and learn together. And Father, I pray, Father, that you would be our uh, you would be our ultimate joy and delight. Thank you, Father, again, that you've given us everything in Jesus. Thank you that in you we are not just multi-millionaires or billionaires, we are multi-trillionaires. Thank you that you've given us, uh, uh, through salvation, something that can never perish, spoil or fade, that is kept in heaven for us uh, until the day that you return. So, Lord, help us to live with that great hope and expectation and confidence uh, in a world that is so materialistic and so away from you. Help us to know how to share that with others. And uh, yeah, Lord, we just uh, look ahead to uh, the Zoom Cafe with Bert. Uh, we pray that you'd encourage him and Lord for our conference as well, in that you prepare our hearts uh, for that time as well. And Lord, help us to grow in all, to, in all that you call us to be and do. In Jesus' name. Amen.